Oh, right. looks like we're live. Welcome to A Growing Concern. We're going to talk, we got a double hitter tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about the privatization of the Bull Run watershed, the first, the first half an hour or so. And then we hope to play a little bit of uh, some photographs and some live streaming feed uh, from the New York Occupy Wall Street. We've got a couple folks coming on who are going to talk about 15, 20 minutes uh, about their trip back to uh, be a part of the Occupy Wall Street situation that's going on. Folks out there don't know what that's about, stay tuned and we'll let you know. This has been going on for uh, 14 days now. They've been occupying Wall Street. There's been an awful lot of, uh, of a police brutality and different things going on, and we'll let you know where you can check in to find that, all about that on your own. But right now we're going to talk about the privatization of the Bull Run Watershed. And welcome to the show, Scott Fernandez. Hi, You've been you on doing? the show a couple of times before. Yes. Got a little hectic getting this thing going, but I think we're ready to go here. And Nancy Newell. Hi, do Jim. All good right. to see good, you again. Good to see you too as well. And Nancy's actually been uh, involved with uh, power and water issues for many years. You go back to working with this on the East Coast with uh, Greg Pallast. Right, that's right. I remember that, uh, yeah. hearing about yeah. that when he was in town. And then when Enron visited town, they wanted our water as well. Not many people realized that. Mm hmm but we well, did a good job on them with the well, electricity they the water grid. And they got the shaft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear that. All right. Well, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll just jump right on this one here. And uh, uh, Scott, uh, you've you've been instrumental in, in getting the word out about the privatization of the Bull Run water. When we talked about it last, we were talking more about covering up the the reservoirs, which the uh, Environmental Protection Agency was demanding that a lot of cities in this country were doing. And there was a lot of back and forth about whether. Uh, I think that the uh, city council wanted a, uh, you wanted the waiver and they were talking about an extension of some kind. Now right. is that still where that stands, just briefly? Well, the variance that the um, variance, I city hall or city council was trying to push was uh, uh, denied by the state, so we've moved on, or they've moved on. And uh, But the good news is that uh, Senator Schumer from New York has gotten the EPA's attention in covering the reservoirs in New York City and has gotten them to revisit the um, covering of their reservoir at um, Hillview Reservoir, New York. And so the EPA is looking at that and going so far as to say that they may rewrite that part of the uh, regulation. So that's good news for us. We've asked our elected officials, both in Cong Congress and the City Council, to move forward with that. And we've gotten some response from uh, a small response from Commissioner Leonard to Senator Merkley, but we have not seen any movement um, to that. We've had the uh, Water Bureau ask the state for, they have asked for a suspension, but we want to see this thing move further and faster, but so far not much has happened on our end. So we're hoping to see something happen soon. I wanted to add too that New York City, they were very aggressive on trying to prevent the whole project from going forward. Right. We, which, we, which they haven't been aggressive here at all. Right, no. right. The council has not. The, certainly a lot of the people, Friends of the Rose Rose and, and Scott's group that he started originally, Citizens for Portland's Water. But uh, they got a 28-year extension, you know, with some excellent work by their environment of, environmental protection. And they had that, and they still want the waiver. They want to cut it out completely, and they can because the president has put in an executive order for a review by the EPA of a situation such as ours where one size doesn't fit all. So you're talking about the, in, in New York they're, they're doing this? Yeah, and New York is parallel to us because they have a very similar station, uh, situation where the water is very similar. Just bigger. But we're <laughs> even in a better spot. We have a better situation to get a waiver and not go ahead and continue to go ahead. We also have better water to begin with, yeah. too. Yes, we yep. do. Does that factor in at all? Are our water's purer? It does to us, but it doesn't uh, uh. apparently to our uh, elected officials, and that's one of the big things that we have. Um, the community's caught in the middle between the inaction of the elected officials. Mm -hmm. That's been a real problem over these last few years. So it's all pretty much just a stalemate right now, then. Right. It's politics, and that's unfortunate. And well, before, before it's an unfortunate ahead. stalemate because they they proceed as if they're not. The, the uh, uh, Portland Water Bureau has asked for a suspension from the state. The state can get involved in the schedule. The state has not responded. The Department of Health has not responded. And in the meanwhile, these contracts are live for Kelly Butte and for Powell Butte. So there is no suspension. So mm -hmm. people are under the false impression that, that, that there has been some kind of setting back of any of these things going forward, and that's not the case. Well, I would think that the only thing that's really setting back is the fact that we're going to have a new mayor and two city councilmen. Mm -hmm. So is that going to kind of keep keep keeping things flattened out until till the elections? 
I uh, wouldn't be surprised because the Water Bureau and the Commissioner in charge is moving as fast as they can behind the scenes to make the uh, this thing happen. And then they will get to a point where they will tell us that they've gone too far and that they can't turn back. Which we've all heard that before. We've all heard that before <laughs> and that just isn't much substance to that. We can stop it right now if we want to and uh, give the ratepayers and the people of, that are drinking the water a break, but they haven't done that. Mm -hmm. So would it be worthwhile for the uh, for viewers out there to get a hold of the city council and let them know that uh, this is what they want this thing to be stopped? It's always worthwhile to have them know what uh, their elected officials and know what they're thinking, both in the city council and the congressional delegations. That's always helpful, but uh, the powers that be at city council are letting this thing move forward. That's a big, big obstacle. And one of the other threats is they put in emergency ordinances they just did recently uh, for the consulting payment by the city to Patton Boggs. You know who Patton Boggs is, Jim? They were the ones that advised uh, Goldman Sachs, who are our municipal bondholders on water, and uh, Enron on how to set up the grid that we, you know, we fought against them even coming into our electric company. They were the consultants and law firm that's years and years old that has done this kind of dirty action. I mean, their mm -hmm. reputation is horrible. And they just put them on as consultants for our drinking water, for Homeland Security. And so we came in and tried to get a public hearing because an emergency ordinance, you don't have a public hearing. You have three minutes to make a case for a public hearing, and they voted unanimously to continue with this consultant. Now, isn't, it, wasn't there some things happening to do with some consultants that were uh, advising the city that were also responsible for building a, a uh, uh, covering some reservoirs in Seattle that went defunct? So is, is, is that play into this at all, or is that something totally separate? Well, that's always a, a, a side issue, and, and very, very good for you to remember that, because it's very important that the same engineers that, that built engineers, these... Engineers, not consultants. That that's built right. the de defective uh, reservoirs up in Seattle, two of them that were extremely defective, that are, they're the ones that are building our Powell Butte and uh, Kelly Butte reservoirs if they get the chance to, mm -hmm. if we don't stop them. And unfortunately, the engineer group who is doing that is very close and has a cozy relationship with our Portland Water Bureau administrator. Very close. So I would encourage the viewers to try to, you know, I'll make it this available so folks can uh, can bone up on this later. But I think that uh, what we're going to talk about today would be something really good to bring up at the at the uh, uh, campaigns when we start having these debates in the near future to, to ask the folks that are uh, that are seeking offices where they stand on this. Right, and there's a whole another subject that's coming up uh, just this week on fluoridation of our drinking water. They're bringing that, that's on the state level, isn't it? Well, they're, they're talking no. about it here. It is, it is a state level, but if the city of Portland pushes it, which Mr. Leonard is trying to do, um, then this thing will, after many, many years of the public saying that they didn't want fluoridation because of the contaminants that come along with it, uh, it's a byproduct of the nuclear, I'm aluminum, gonna, and fertilizer industries. I was just going to mention that, yeah. Do you know the uh, name of Mark, what's his, uh, how do you say it, Weiner? Weiner? It's Weiner, I think. Weiner. Uh, you know who he is? Highly influential in City Hall. Mm -hmm. And he has been hired by the firm that does fluoridation to convince three city council people to vote for fluoridation. And he's working long hours to do this right mm -hmm. now. So we're keeping an eye on an emergency ordinance on that so the public doesn't get bamboozled. Get bamboozled into that. Well, uh, it seems like it, it's good that you folks come on. Cause, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't really pay a lot of attention to local media. But, uh, has any of this been making out, been making it out to to uh, broadcast TV, or are they talking about this at all? I haven't seen anything on the on the media. Uh, there are some bits and pieces that come through on the uh, on the print media, but that's we just hear about it really secondhand. This this stuff is really under the radar. Well, the the big contractor on the project, CH2M Hill, has a reputation. Spokane just went through a huge campaign to try to kick him out of there. New Orleans kicked him out in 2002, so that name is well known. Hanford and you know a lot mm -hmm. of the things they don't do a satisfactory at all uh, job with what they're hired to do and, and millions yeah. of dollars are wasted so that is public also what's public is um, the, the the fact that uh, we had uh, Tinklegate and I don't know if you knew mm -hmm. that in England they held an election to fire our Portland Water Bureau chief because he was so stupid about the urine incident and the cameras don't indicate clearly that the, it ever even hit the water so, so Tinklegate, so, folks yeah. can Google, Google Tinklegate. <laughs> That's a good one. But you know, we've got a, a PowerPoint here, and I don't know, we got like 20 minutes left. 
maybe a little bit less. And uh, do you want to get into some of these these uh, JPEGs or whatever, let folks know what's going on? Sure, we can get into this and move pretty quickly. Um, if we could show the first slide on there. We're there talking we tonight about privatization of the Bull Run water system. And privatization is the change from public ownership and management to a corporate organization. And this... So you know, it's now run by the city, but it, they're trying to move it towards being corporate owned and run. Exactly, and that's that's a big problem. And there was a, an attempt back almost a decade ago now uh, to try and have this happen through a regionalization process through the Regional Drinking Water Initiative, and it failed thanks to community activism. So it was a vote? No, it was one vote short, but they didn't hold the vote in city council because the community got so uh, engaged in it at the right time. We were involved with it early on and saw what was going to happen, uh, hap a handful of us on the Portland Utility Review Board, and then we brought it to the City Council and demanded that they do a financial review of due diligence, which hadn't been done, and then that's what stopped it. And so do you still have the same opportunity to put the tamper on now? No, as we go through this thing, well, they, oh, they right. learn from that experience and they, they're taking a different direction. They're closing doors on us, huh? Yeah. So we'll go to the next one. Privatization starts with elected greed and donations from contractors, and we've seen this in other cities, and corporate greed, profits and lower service is what the community gets. And there's a, there's a connection between the two also. Very, very close. And this next slide will show you uh, a prime example, privatization of drinking water in Indianapolis that took place in the early 90s through the 90s and into the 2000s. And these are the... These are the um, comments that are directly from them that uh, the citizens got so outraged they there were charges of inadequate oversight fraud conflicts of interest etc cetera, etc cetera, as we can as your viewers can read through that and it's brought by the company Veolia which is very close in this in this region right now working with the city of Wilsonville that's for the, that's for the uh, drinking the Willamette River isn't it right and right. they, they yeah. just took over the sewage part too well they you know they've got the time and the money to do things slowly <laughs> which, which is which makes, makes that's part of doing it under the radar is doing things incrementally. Exactly, mm -hmm. and they're very very skilled at doing that type of stuff, and they've that's, learned that, from that, other areas. That's Bull Run uh, Reservoir. This is Bull Run. This is what we have now, and we'll see the transition if we if we stay on this path, the transition that we will see eventually uh, if we are privatized, if we continue doing what we're doing. This is another shot of oh, Bull Run Lake. This is the pure pristine water that we're dealing with. Another shot of a stream up in Bull Run. But here's the future if we stay on this path that we are on. And this was just brought out over this year, last year of, of our sources of water that the engineers want in this regionalization process to blend all these sources of water up at Powell Butte. This was the plan in 2001, and that's what's going to happen now if we continue down this road, if we don't demand that we get a waiver from this LT2. We can see four new intakes at the bottom next to the Willamette River, um, three new intakes out of the four. The, the one on the, on the far right intake is the current Wilsonville plant. Is at the very on the Tualatin River there? And that's a new plant that they're trying to put in eventually over time. And then up at, up at the top in the middle under the Columbia River uh, lettering is a new plant uh, water source of, in Sovie Island. So they want to blend all these water sources at Powell Butte eventually. You mean pump them all to Powell Butte? Yeah, put them in kind of a, the, the water will be blended as it goes through uh, from the Willamette and then the Bull Run and the Hillsboro area. All these will blend eventually in, in the Powell Butte area. This is what they're trying to, this was the plan from the beginning. And this isn't my imagination, we'll get to that in just a minute, but this is what we're gonna see with, um, this is the Willamette River upstream from the intake and this is the toxic mixing zone that we can see there coming from a sewage holding tank up in the, uh, the white area is, this, is the sewage deal. And so the sewage is being This is the Willamette. Just right. Sure. Yeah, I thought that's what you said. So this is what we would be drinking if we continue down this road. This is another discharge coming in there. The pipe on the upper hand, the small one, is an irrigation intake. So they could be irrigating vegetables or something that can be consumed. We don't know what. Over time, this is the intake at the Willamette drinking water plant, but there's so much debris that builds up that they have to reverse the flow of water and blow out the uh, debris that builds up. So this is what we're seeing here. 
on this. The reason why we're, we're in this situation now is because the engineers, some of them from Portland, helped write the LT2 EPA regulation. They took over the public process and they administer it too in EPA. And the cor Portland corporate engineer involvement is very heavy. They want to build uh, covering our reservoirs and our treatment plant. And we don't want them to cover our reservoirs for many reasons because of we had, since the last time we had that issue with uh, the Japanese uh, nuclear thing that, that put uh, radioactivity in the air and there was a concern that it might come into our watershed through open, through open reservoirs. Through open reservoirs. But I want to remind the audience that in 2004 we had the independent review panel and they looked at all sorts of um, scenarios where there could be contamination of the open reservoirs and they felt that even in situations like that that it would not be harmful because it would be nothing more than what you would be exposed to in everyday life. What we are worried about is if they cover the reservoirs that there would be radon gas coming into the um, water from the Columbia South Shore well field and that it would have no place to escape, only it would escape right. in the homes and businesses and workplaces. Well, what would stop the, uh, the, the radiation in the air to, to get into the water, into the Bull Run watershed and the Willamette River? They're wide open to it too. That's they can't cover those. That's no, exactly right. That's right. And so we, the risk of is, is has, wasn't even measurable because the, the levels coming out of uh, Japan were so low. But it, I just want to reassure that the audience knows that the covering of the reservoirs would, would provide a significant risk versus the open reservoirs that would be minimal. I remember when you were on the program the last time because they're covered and those, the, those, uh, those waters aren't able to breathe. Exactly. And it's oxygenation and sun that give it a good, healthy water where they would lose that in the covered reservoirs. Well, just the difference between a, a, a lake that has an in, inflow and an outflow where the fresh water keeps moving, or a pond where it doesn't have any inflow and outflow and it just gets scummy. Exactly. So it seems like the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. And, and the EPA is, is willing to review the rule based on science alone, which stands for us because the parasite is in closed systems, not in our open system. Right. So, and we've tested that. I guess 11,000 times just through this one process improved it. Exactly. So. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, going back to this isn't uh, something that we're making up. This was the regionalization process was, and if you have a pencil and paper, you might want to put this down because this is the, the document that the engineers use, the Regional Transmission and Storage Strategy Report from 2000. This is documented where they want to use the Willamette and Columbia Rivers and another thing to look at is why big banks may be trying to buy up your drinking water system. That's an excellent report and summary of what we're talking about and the privatization and these corporations and Wall Street and banks that want to take over these things because there's a lot of money in it and everybody needs it and uses it. Mm -hmm. This is where a lot of cash is. Well, it sounds kind of wonky, but at the same time, we've got to remember that they use this wonk is what's used to take things over. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you've, I'm sure you've talked on the show about the shock doctrine. Naomi Klein certainly outlines it, and uh, they recently had it in Harper's, an issue on how these things parallel what Enron's whole structure was to take over the electricity grid they're doing for water. And, and the, the uh, privatization rate in the United States now, I think, is close to 60 percent privatization in the smaller areas. Mm -hmm. It's being pushed on all levels. Yeah, and, and the uh, people behind, of course, Goldman Sachs, are very much an active part of our debt right now, and one of the distinguished people in our in our community, the foul investors informed me that they're doing predatory trading where they, like a merger, they're trading paper and getting paid. It means nothing, the trading of the paper, and they can do that with municipal bond paper as well. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know who the actual underwriters are. It could be China, it could be, you know, some of, it, some of those municipal bonds. Mm -hmm. It's see. not clear to the public. Now this BRRDWA, that's the Bull Run Regional Drinking Water Agency. That's the name that they wanted to give it. Oh, so they got it all set up. They right? had it all set up. All right, we'll move along here. We got about 10 minutes. Okay, this is part of the privatization that I was talking about, and the privatization of the water system in Wilsonville took place almost a decade ago, but now this year they went into privatization of the sewage treatment plant at, at the city of Wilsonville. And this is one of the things, one of the fallout things that comes with privatization is that good people lose their jobs and this is uh, an excerpt from the job description when they changed over from, um, from city to, to privatization. Uh, this position is currently part of the union and uh, the future position will be subcontracted out with, with the city's uh, resolution to turn it over to be privatized. 
and the city's answer to, to those people losing their jobs was, we don't want to manage people, we just want to manage contracts. So when the privatization takes place, people that had good family living wage jobs, they're going to lose their jobs and come in, maybe be rehired, maybe not, at a much, much lower wage. Like what happened up at uh, Longview with the longshoremen up there. Yeah, yeah, and it's happened in our Parks Bureau already, and you know, the union jobs have been lost because of the use of prisoners instead of union people because of the cost of high water, the park mm. can't provide the service maintenance. Right. So the traditional method is to approach the electeds and the electeds would sell it to the community. That would be through the city council. As I said, we tried it and they tried it in 2001, it didn't work. So they've thought of a new approach to privatize and Nancy's very good at understanding this, but uh, it's an increase of debt of the Portland Water Bureau with bonds for a problem that doesn't exist in our water. That's, that's what they're doing, debt swamping us. And water rates are, have gone up, or will be going up 85% over the next few years. New York banks, and, uh, et cetera, are buying bonds and making interest on our rates. Frequent <laughs> bond offerings more in the future will come and increase our, our Portland Water Bureau debt, which is at 40% right now. And that's the reason our city has fast-tracked this whole project when it didn't have to. That it could have easily taken the steps that New York City took. And instead they've done the opposite and obviously the whole scheme behind it is they want to capture the infrastructure which they can do. Because the revenue now is half in the Water Bureau of what the debt is, the long-term debt is. And, and Nick Fish said that the city auditor has called attention to it and generations will be paying for it even if they still have water. You know, they'll be paying huge debt as a result of all this activity mm. of fast tracking and emergency ordinances and sure. contracts that are not supervised, et cetera. Put that on top of all the money yeah. we borrowed for our wars yeah. that yeah. our grandkids will be paying for. Exactly. But we so don't we, want to get off into that. So. And we have no control, no regulation on what they put in our water once it's privatized. None. The city will have no control over that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, see, yeah, and this is a very, very big problem because, and Nancy's exactly right, that any, any chemical that meets uh, EPA specifications and they don't check everything that comes through it could be sourced from anywhere from around the world with no quality assurance control at all and that's very very big concern. So fluoridation that alone, you, weren't you Scott talking about that, the Chinese toxins? Fluoridation alone, there's a lot of chemicals coming in out of Asia and we know that these things are not uh, free of contaminants so this is, we would not know what we were drinking. That's a very big problem. I think Dr. Oz was just talking about recently the arsenic in our, in our uh, uh, apple juice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. A lot of that was from China mm -hmm. or other places. Well, we know that we got some contaminated uh, pet food and toothpaste with a, a chemical called melamine that came in uh, over the last couple of years, and, and that was a very big contaminant. So the privatized process, the, the debt increases, the rates increase, the solution that the city would see is the private corporate contract or default on the bonds that cannot be made through the ratepayers. The ratepayers right now, uh, we're seeing our rates increase so much that uh, many of the citizens are using their credit cards. And this is only the beginning. Uh, we've got a long ways to go. These guys are planning on putting out new, dip, new bond offerings every year. So we should see another one coming up in the first part of next year. And all we have to show right now for the bonds is a big hole at Powell Butte. Do, 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 does the citizens vote on that bond? No. These are something that the council puts out. And a lot of times they have put these things out, like Nancy said, through emergency ordinances. And this is, this is troublesome because the emergencies are uh, very hard to, to stop. That's tantamount to our, our Congress in Washington, D.C., signing some of these things at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and our well, biggest problem in, in the city council is we have two lame ducks. We have Sam Adams. His vote is not influenced by being concerned about continuing to be elected. Mm -hmm. Neither is Randy Leonard. And these are the fast-track people. I mean, these are the people that have an agenda. I'm not sure that some of them are attached to privatization, but they certainly are foolish not to recognize it as, as a major part mm -hmm. of the whole process. Um, and so to get the third vote with Mr. Salzman in office, very often they will get what they need. And that's how they get the emergency ordinance yeah, he's, passed. He's pretty developer-friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So... All right, we'll continue on a little, about five, a little over five minutes. So this is just a picture from last uh, <laughs> spring's, uh, I don't know if it's so clear, but... Yeah. Uh, we our played that video on the show, too, so folks, yeah. hopefully some of the viewers saw that. We want to thank you for being there and, and supporting it and writing about it in, uh, in, in your uh, 
blog and stuff and, and it just uh, helped get a lot of people out there and we were very clear that we want the waiver um, and not a variance or any other thing because the waiver is the only permanent solution that can be done. Mm -hmm. Well that makes some pretty good video when everybody and it was it was a uh, 700 against one there with, with Randy Leonard and everybody was letting him know what they thought and uh, I recently saw that playing out at Metro East so it's it's getting some air time and it, people sh you know hopefully people will know that that this is an important issue. Yeah we recently fly out this summer we've been doing a lot of notif you know, notices to people and there was a free concert over at Fernhill Park and that whole neighborhood is looking at and starting to build cisterns because they're so concerned about water costs they want to avoid the cost and have their own source for clean water Good idea. And, and these projects are going forward and there's a fellow that was at Doubletree I don't know his name offhand but he he's designing the cisterns and ha having you learn how to do it yourself well, I'm glad and to it's hear a there's movement. a way to decentralize the water because I always thought that we pretty much had to depend upon uh, a centralized s situation. But like with electricity, people can generate that themselves. I'm glad to hear that there's cisterns yeah. being designed that people can actually do their own water as yeah, well. Yeah, it's a lot more difficult with apartment dwellers. You yeah, know. You yeah, it's a separation, once again, of people's ability to do it, which isn't right. right. It's a human right to water. Our council doesn't treat it that way. You know, people are paying, uh, they're out of work, and they can't afford all this. They lose their homes, or they lose the ability to pay their water bills. I mean, this is all happening. This is real right now. Mm -hmm. I see you got something about the waiver up here, which I've been curious about. And so that people always ask, why a waiver? And as Nancy said, she did a lot of work this summer to hand out uh, information about this. And as people become educated, they really believe that the waiver is the solution and the only solution. It's simple, it's cost effective, and it can happen immediately if our congressional people would get on board. Because we don't have sewage exposure, we don't have a public health problem. So we need congressional inter intervention because we just don't need to have our reservoirs covered or add any treatment that will, uh, both of those will contribute to degrading our water quality with added chemicals. So a waiver exempting us from e L EPA LT2 is the right thing, and we need it now. And so anything you can do to contact your elected officials, both at city council and in the Congress, would be very helpful. But uh, if all of a sudden things got turned around and, and we, we managed to establish this waiver, would this uh, stop this uh, progression towards the bonds and, and, the, and, and the debt and everything that's going on? Absolutely. That would stop yep. it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, uh, Jim, we're looking into some lawsuits to also have that effect, just in case. At least get an know. injunction anyway. Yeah. Yeah, we're working on it. A TRO, we'll keep you posted. I think it's called temporary restraining order. Or something. Yeah, we we made a request to the state about 90 days ago. It's about to expire. There was no uh, response, mm -hmm. and so we we think we have the ability to file that lawsuit and do an injunction, and we're working All on right. that. Do you have any more pages here? We're done. Uh, the one at the bottom is citizensforportlandwater.org. You can go to that website and see much more information. All right, folks can do that, and uh, we don't have that to put that up, but I'm glad you have it. So it'd be www.citizensforportlandwater.org, all one word, no spaces, but it's, right. it's easier to see what that is. Exactly. Well, I sure appreciate you bringing this in here, and, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about this more in the future. Uh, this is like the third time you've been on, and yeah. and uh, I know that there's a, there's a organizations, there's a web page. What's the what's the Facebook web page? I should say. I think it's Friends of Bull Run. Friends of Bull Run. That is right. it. Right, I remember it because that's where I posted that video. And so uh, we still got about you know a minute or two here left. Anything you want, any more exhortations you want to give to the folks out there? Well, I want to, we have to make clear to council, uh, Commissioner Leonard is saying he's asked for a waiver. And it's not, it's, the way he's written it is not. There's confusion because Senator Merkley is in, has been uh, pressuring the EPA to do so. And the city keeps giving phony signals and not the right legal standing in order to get the waiver. So when people call in, they have to be very clear that they understand that there are things going on that shouldn't be, and they want a written notice of waiver request unanimously out of the council. And that will feed into the campaigns as well, so we can get candidates on board and hopefully get the right action. Sure. Before we uh, end this segment, I want to make sure, get off camera here, that the guests are here for the next segment. We need to make sure of that. Yeah. They are here. All right. So any, any final words, Scott? I just want to thank you for all the work you've done for this effort and to educate the community and, and 
post these things and, and really helping the situation for us. And I appreciate oh, that. You're Thank welcome. you. And uh, I hope that we can get more people involved in this that, that do uh, the media, because I know the media has, uh, as typically, they if they do cover it, they cover it pretty shallow. They don't go deep into it. I haven't heard a lot of the, the in-depth treatment and analysis uh, in any of the corporate media that, that I, we've gotten here today in just a sh short half an hour. We've covered, we've covered things that I don't think They've, that we've ever heard before, at least not on uh, Oregon Live or any any of those. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been doing this battle? I've been involved for over a decade now, and uh, it's been uh, re very rewarding. And I've met a lot of good people, like Nancy's one, and there are many other hard workers. So it's been a very big community effort, but we still got a, a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. So we hope that we, the community will get involved and ask for a waiver. That's you know that's why I do this program mainly is to uh, to try to uh, let the community know what's going on out there and hopefully they'll join up and put their shoulder to the wheel any way they can or their ear to the phone or whatever it's going to take because if uh, we don't we don't raise a ruckus nothing's going to be done you know if you don't turn the light on uh, elected officials can go about doing what they want to do and they can meet with their lobbyists and their engineers and their consultants and uh, they don't have to worry about the public if they know the public isn't watching and isn't communicating with them. So I think that's important. That's probably the most important thing citizens can do.